Elon Musk's ambitions to travel to Mars go back to at least 2001, when he conceptualized sending an automated greenhouse module to Mars using a refurbished Russian ICBM. After his visit to Russia, it became obvious that that was not going to work, so he started up SpaceX with the intended result being to reach Mars for the purpose of colonization. When Musk first announced his intended plans to develop an interplanetary craft, the moniker he came up with was the Mars Colonial Transport, or MCT. Many aspiring artists began rendering what they thought such a craft might look like. In late September 2016, in Guadalajara, Mexico, Musk unveiled his initial vision for colonizing Mars with up to a million people by 2050 using his newly renamed ITS, or Interplanetary Transport System. Since 2016, the design and name have continuously changed and so have the specs of the ship. As advertised on the SpaceX website currently, the expectation for Starship is that it will be a cylindrical vessel 30 feet across, 160 feet tall, with a payload capacity of 100 tons. The website claims this will be the vessel to take humanity to Mars and beyond, to make our civilization multiplanetary. Now that SpaceX has delivered a single two-man crew dragon to the International Space Station, four years behind schedule, Musk is shifting the entire company's focus to the colonization of Mars. This article for thesun.co.uk outlines four of the goals as stated by Musk in the spring of 2020 to bring a fleet of 1,000 starships to Mars in the next 10 years, each of which will be home to 100 crew, and there will be three launches every day. For this video, let's assume Musk can make good on those claims. However, to see what a more likely crew size for this vessel would be, find and click on the first episode in this series. The fourth claim on this article is that it would take nine years to transport one million people to Mars. These are the claims that have been made for at least four years, and none of the reporters covering the stories have bothered to run the numbers for viability. So we're going to do that for them. First off, 1 million people riding in crews of 100 will require 10,000 ships, not 1,000, or else each crewed vessel will need to make at least 10 round trips on three-year missions. If you're not counting travel time, then this nine-year math holds up with the previous claim of three ships per day to reach the 300-person quota to make 1 million people in space. However, according to the SpaceX website, each of these manned vessels is going to require refueling while in orbit before it can set off to Mars. The Mars Transportation Architecture slide on Space.com shows that for each crewed vessel launched, up to four refueling craft are required, so that three launches per day is actually 15 launches per day. Since 2016, Musk has been broadcasting through news releases and Twitter that these three crew launches per day will all queue up together in orbit, then travel together to Mars like a Battlestar Galactica convoy. For the period of 26 months leading up to a Mars transfer orbit window that lasts for only 30 days, three launches per day would actually be 2,340 ships in orbit by the time the convoy can depart Earth. So on the first day, three crew launches and 12 fuel launches would put 300 crew into orbit in refueled vessels. On the second day there will be another three crewed and 12 fuel launches to put a total of six colony ships in orbit carrying 600 people. So that's 600 crew days for that day plus the 300 crew days from the day prior. Day three again another three more ships total of nine ships in orbit with 18 cumulative ship days and 1800 accumulated crew days. Still following? These are how the numbers start out, and this is how they finish. By the time the 2,340 ships are queued up and ready to head off to Mars for this particular transfer orbit, they will have accumulated 91,377,000 crew days. And on top of the 2,340 crewed launches, there would also have been almost 10,000 fuel launches as well. At this point, we need the reminder that Elon has promised only 1,000 ships in the next 10 years, so one of the claims is already disproven. Either he needs to build far more than 1,000 ships, or he needs to take much longer than 9 years to achieve this, and he'll miss his 2024, 2026, and 2029 windows. 
In episode one, we shared the eating habits of the ISS astronauts and found that the crew eats three very expensive packaged meals per day. Each 1.83 pound meal cost almost $20,000 to send into space at $10,000 per pound and water costs an extra nine grand. So if you have 91 million crew days racked up and each crew day requires three meals at $18,300 per meal, your 234,000 orbiting crew members would have racked up a meal bill of over $5 trillion just waiting around for the Mars transfer orbit window to open. And that's just the cost of getting the food into the low Earth orbit. That's not counting the prep cost or packaging. Who knows what that would add to the total bill. Not only does this not include the food they'll need for the mission, most of the ships that went up first would already have run out of supplies several times over and required additional flights to restock. In fact, the first ship that went up would already have consumed more than 230 tons of food all by itself. And the 234,000 persons in transit will consume another $4.7 trillion in food every year they are off planet. So really, we could end this presentation here, but let's keep going. The option to queuing in orbit would be to launch from the surface only during the orbit transfer windows, weather permitting, refueling straight away and immediately making their way to Mars, thereby saving the orbiting food costs. They will miss the 2020 window when ULA is sending the Perseverance rover. SpaceX might be sending a pair of supply craft in 2022 and two small manned crews in 2024 if their wildest dreams and predictions come true. The next window after that comes up in 2026. And between 2026 and 2050, there are only 12 such windows. Meaning, each window would require launching 28 crewed vessels per day, plus 112 refueling craft for those crewed vessels. And we haven't even spoken about supply vehicles and the convoy carrying equipment, materials, and additional food stores. The next point of concern is their projected travel time to Mars. On the SpaceX website, they are advertising they can get passengers to Mars in just six months, plus, of course, the time they spent in orbit around Earth. But this number seems unlikely since every other craft that went to Mars took longer than this. Averaging out these six missions, you get a little over nine months, not six. And that also happens to be the answer given by Wikipedia on the subject. Even the transfer orbit calculator is calling it 258 days, so the claim of six months seems dodgy out of the gate. One of the lofty claims that is made about Starship is that it's so much more powerful that it should be able to cut the transit time in half. But here's the issue with that. Starship is a very large craft, especially compared to other vessels that have traveled to Mars. If you want to go faster, you have to not only have the fuel to speed it up when it leaves, you also need to have at least that much fuel again to slow it down before arriving. Fuel takes up volume inside a craft, and Starship will be very tight on space as it is. It is more likely that the craft will use the most fuel efficient method for getting to Mars meaning it likely won't be going any faster than any other vehicle that has made the trip before it. If Musk is to be believed, three cruise ships per day will be put into orbit. That's rain or shine to keep the schedule, and everybody who has ever had an expected launch viewing scrubbed knows you simply can't launch every day. Sometimes the weather will scrub the missions, sometimes the missions have scrubbed themselves. The safest rockets come in at around 90% mission success. That stat includes the SpaceX Falcon 9, credit where it's due, although the recovery rate is significantly lower. The best on the market was the Delta II at 98% before it was retired. Better still was the Space Shuttle at 98.5% mission success rate, which was a 99.3 launch success rate given that one vehicle failed on re-entry. With spaceflight, there will eventually be a vehicle failure, and if the agency is lucky, it's only 2% of the time. When Challenger exploded 73 seconds into flight on January 28, 1986, killing all aboard, it shocked the world. There had been a dozen shuttle launches the previous year, and another dozen before that. The Challenger disaster shut down the program for 32 months, and the entire program was picked over with a fine-tooth comb before Discovery took off again in September of 1988. When dealing with human spaceflight, there has to be an expectation of casualty. And since the Starship has absolutely no abort or escape system planned, a vehicle failure is a guarantee of human loss. In a fleet of 1,000 ships, 
history would indicate we should expect to lose at least 20 of them, but more likely the number would be closer to 100 of every thousand as the industry standard. The questions are going to be, what happens when the first one explodes? What is the protocol likely to be? Without doubt, all the other launches in line will be suspended pending an investigation, especially in the case of human casualties. What about the ships in orbit, queuing up and refueling? Do they keep going without a full convoy? Do they land back on Earth until the next window? Would each of them be self-contained enough to conduct the mission without them, or even by themselves? Given the limitations of the vehicle and the outlined cost we expect them to incur just for food, we have no faith in Musk's ability to launch one million people into orbit. In episode four, we'll explain why we also have no faith in colonists surviving the trip, even if he could. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. We look forward to producing more material for you. If you'd like to see it, click subscribe.